uh, with us uh, today. I think uh, today's event couldn't have come at a better time as the UK seeks to renew and, and, and revitalize its relationship uh, with the Commonwealth in the, in the wake of our departure from the EU. And, and I, I firmly believe that the UK has to be that outward looking global Britain that our Prime Minister uh, speaks so much about. Uh, a Britain that champions free trade, democracy, uh, the, the, the rule of, of law and human rights. Uh, and I think with all of those elements in mind, it, it's extremely important uh, that our relationship uh, with long-standing good old friends and allies like Australia is at the very, very heart of that ambition. So our guest today is a very special person, uh, one of Australia's most highly respected prime ministers with a huge uh, string of achievements to his name, including gun control, fiscal discipline and industrial uh, reform. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Sunil uh, to formally introduce John. But John, thank you so much for being with us. Over to you, Sunil. I'd like to echo Paul and uh, Helen's word there. Uh, thank you for joining today and I hope you really enjoy uh, today's session. Um, John Howard served as Australia's Prime Minister between March 1996 to November 2007. He's the nation's second longest serving Prime Minister and was a Member of Parliament for 33 years. We're delighted to have you with us today. Um, how have you been coping in the past year uh, under these unprecedented times, John? Well, I'm happy to say um, both as a nation and for me individually, the pandemic has gone uh, rather well. Australia has handled it very well and um, we've been fortunate. Uh, I think some of that is geography and weather. I mean, some of it is policy. Um, and some of it is due to the fact that there's a natural, because we're a federation, there's a natural decentralization uh, of the public health responses. And, uh, and we, we have done very well. I mean, sure, I haven't been able to travel. And one of our sons lives in the United States. We haven't seen him or any members of his family for more than a year, but that's a very common situation now. But uh, Apart from that, um, uh, sure, and there were certain, been certain restrictions on sport, although I'm very happy to say that I was able to see with my wife the five days of the Sydney cricket test between India and Australia, and it was a very exciting game. And uh, there were some restrictions on the spectator capacity, but um, apart from things like that, um, uh, we, we have been very fortunate. Uh, we really have, and uh, I know it's been more difficult in, in the United Kingdom, um, and, and uh, there are no doubt endless debates about what the right responses are, although you're doing very well with the, with the uh, vaccination program. That's, that's, that's very, very successful. We're starting to vaccinate people, with, and, and it will roll out as quickly as possible, but uh, uh, if I may say so, as somebody who applauded Britain's decision to leave the European Union. And, uh, I think the success of your vaccination program has rather uh, vindicated that decision because uh, uh, you were just able to do it on your own. And, uh, and that, in a sense, is what the decision was all about. But anyway, maybe some of you were Romanian, so I won't test, uh, I won't test that point. It's, uh, we've, 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 we've done well. On the, on the pandemic. Um, oh. yeah, you, you have some strong ties to the Conservative Party. Um, some may not know that your middle name is Winston, and which was named after Winston Churchill. Um, and also in 1964, when you worked in London, you volunteered for a Conservative constituency in London. How did really? your political interest first start? And when did you know you wanted to be involved in politics? Oh. Probably when I was about um, 12 or 13, I started following politics avidly. Uh, and my father, I was born in 1939, and my father and mother gave me the name Winston, it's a middle Christian name. It was before he was prime minister, it was when a lot of conservatives uh, didn't like him, as you remember. 
and we're not remember as you no doubt learned. But um, my father thought he was talking great common sense on the threats of the era. Um, that's a long time ago. Um, I'm very proud to have that as my middle name. But uh, I got very interested in um, politics from a very early age. And was obviously absorbed in the politics of my own country, but I followed the politics of Britain and politics of the United States and the politics of the world very, very closely. And I did come to at a year in, in Europe, in, based in London in 1964, and I worked for the then Conservative Party candidate, a member of the electorate of Hoban St Pancras. I don't know whether that still exists as an electorate, but I, I must have been the kiss of death because he lost the seat. Um, and, but he later came back in a by-election to a very safe seat in Surrey, and he remained in the House of Commons. His name was Geoffrey Johnson Smith, and he remained in the House of Commons for years. And I met him uh, when I was Prime Minister and one of my visits to London. And, uh, but I enjoyed that campaigning. One of the big differences, of course, in Britain is you don't have compulsory voting. And um, uh, you, you spend a lot of time making sure that people who say they're conservatives <laughs> actually vote. Um, yeah. You can argue for and against compulsory voting. We've had it for years, but it does alter the character of the campaigns of the different parties. It's fair to say you know, you've experienced a lot of ups and downs in your political journey, and your book reflects that. For for those who haven't read it, it's, it's an incredible book. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, recommend it to others. Um, the question I'd ask is, do you think the adversity and battles you faced in your career made you a better leader? Oh, they always, they do. Of course they did. I, I learned, uh, I was leader for a number of years in the 80s. And I lost an election in 1987 to Bob Hall, who was then a very successful Labor Prime Minister. And um, I learned a lot from that. My party got rid of me. And they voted me out of the leadership in 1989. And then uh, they went through two other leaders, and um, three in fact. And then they finally uh, felt that I had a better chance of winning than anybody else. I think I had learned a lot from uh, the earlier experience, particularly how to relate to colleagues, because in a parliamentary system, the relationship between the leader and the parliamentary party is fundamental. And uh, I mean, you will know from your experience that the relationship between the, the prime minister of the time and what, I mean, the 1922 committee, which is really the entirety of the parliamentary party, isn't it? It's your historic name for it. Um, uh, but um, that relationship is so important and it's especially important <clears throat> in Australia for the Liberal Party because the leaders, the decision about the leader is still within the entire gift of the parliamentary party. The, the non-parliamentary membership has no role in choosing uh, the leader, the parliamentary leader. Uh, in the Labor Party, interesting enough, it does. I have a bit of a hybrid system, which is a bit closer to the system you have. And I often tell people who argue for that that um, uh, the greatest uh, conservative leader of uh, in my lifetime, Margaret Thatcher, uh, was, of course, chosen at a time when it was the entire gift of the parliamentary party. And I just I often say to those people, <clears throat> if you'd have had um, the hybrid system then would she have defeated Mr. Heath? Good question. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I know a lot of our members are big Margaret Thatcher fans, uh, as am I, so um, I'm sure they'll be happy to hear you speak so highly of her. Um, there's so many fascinating things about your time as Prime Minister that I would love to discuss. Um, but before we do, um, there's much that we can to be said about that time in history itself. Um, what were some of the biggest changes you noticed in society from when you started as prime minister to when you ended? I'll give you an example. Um, I've seen some that you recently discussed, which was almost the obsession with language that we currently use. Um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a day that doesn't go by where standard language is almost becoming uh, offensive to a lot of people. Um, what sort of changes between 1996 to 2007 did you notice 
And were you forced to change at all? Oh, um, I wasn't forced to change any of the fundamental beliefs I had. Uh, I felt, feel very strongly that to be an effective leader, you have to have a set of values and, and policy goals and you've got to stick to them. Um, clearly, one of the biggest changes uh, that occurred that was a benefit to Australia was the uh, way in which we battened down on our trading relationship with North Asia. When I became Prime Minister, China was our sixth largest trading partner. When I was defeated in 2007, China was our largest export destination. And, and, and that trading relationship is very important. We sell an enormous amount of high quality thermal coal, uh, uh, iron ore, uh, natural gas to China, and that's a hugely valuable thing. So that was a, that the development of that relationship was, was a very big change. Uh, and, and, and it was a very beneficial change. I think socially, uh, we mirrored many of the changes in the Western world. I think in my uh, adult life, the biggest change has been the changing role in, 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 in uh, uh, the, the role of women in our society. There are more women have entered politics. We don't believe in quotas, uh, but uh, it is important to make sure that the parliamentary party properly reflects the different balances uh, uh, within our community. I think that was a, a big change. Uh, the tide of political correctness is uh, sort of being resisted, but I, it has to be firmly res resisted. I, I'm I'm appalled at any suggestion that you start getting rid of terms like brother and sister and 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 so forth. And, and I think those developments should be banged on the head by people in authority. There is a tendency to say, oh, it doesn't matter, don't get worked up about that, John. I think those things do matter. And uh, uh, I think the the uh, the tide of uh, wokeism or wokery, uh, I don't know what the abstract noun is, um, uh, is, is something that ought to be resisted. But I, I don't think the excesses of that are quite as great in Australia as they are in the United States, uh, nor as they might be in, in your country. Uh, it's, it's a bit hard to make a judgment about that. But there's, there's little doubt that one of the great strengths that our country still has is that we are a very large, we're a middle-class society. The, the, the spread of the middle class in Australia is, is broader than it is in either the United Kingdom or the United States. And I often tell people that I think we have found the sweet spot with welfare services, uh, not as harsh as they are in the United States and they're not as interventionist as many of them are in, in Europe. I think less so in Britain than in, on the mainland of Europe. Uh, now these are differences that are important because we are all, you know, old, well-established, functioning liberal democracies. Uh, and of course, um, uh, it's important to make those comparisons. Um, a great example of the language uh, example that's been discussed is almost Mr. and Mrs., which... Uh, oh, that's, well, that's uh, good. I mean, you know, I just think that they're the sort of things that should be just laughed out of court. Uh, but unfortunately, too many people who should know better take them too seriously. And uh, say, so, well, you mustn't do that, you might offend somebody. Well, frankly, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm offended by you know, attempts to remove a, a usage of language which has served us well for hundreds of years. Uh, it it kind of leads me quite well to my next point. Um, one of the big issues and changes we're now seeing, and some of that I'm certainly not a fan of, is uh, identity politics. You know, it seems now people identify the minority that they want to help and then select policies um, rather than looking for policies that generally seek uh, to benefit the whole of society. What are your thoughts on the shift in identity politics and where do you see it going? Well, I think, um, um, I mean, I'm opposed to it very strongly. And, and I think there's quite a lot of field evidence that have failed. Um, uh, one of the main reasons that Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump was that she played identity politics. And I think the, the Australian Labor Party in the last election 
although it was nowhere near as heavy on identity politics as uh, the American Democrats had been, it played that card and it didn't work. Um, but it has to be resisted. I grew up in politics believing that what you did was fashion a policy that appealed across the board. And for example, in an area like small business, which is um, sacred to most liberals in Australia, and I understand will leave conservatives in Britain, um, you, you build a policy that's appealing. In, the question of whether the small businessman is, 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 is got an Anglo-Celtic name or he's, or he's got an Indian name or he's got a, a Chinese name, whatever, that's the Greek, it doesn't matter. That's, that's irrelevant. You fashion the policy. Uh, to suit uh, the, the discipline, which includes people of all ethnicities. And I think um, uh, identity politics has had a, uh, a pretty ordinary experience in America and Australia in recent years, but that doesn't mean to say there aren't plenty of people who still advocate it. And uh, I would just encourage my conservative friends to resist it like crazy. It's something um, uh, also along the lines of identity politics and general sort of uh, polarization. We had this chat with uh, Malcolm Turnbull, um, uh, and we, we both agreed that there was a, a real lack of tolerance in discussions nowadays. Um, he felt the Liberal Party was becoming hostage to the far right. I personally feel like in the UK, we almost have the opposite issue. You know, it seems, especially in mainstream media and social media, we all must be on the left or quite extremely socially liberal. Um, and it's interesting to hear what you said. And there is a real irony as, you know, uh, often the people who say we, we should be open and free, it seems it's only to those thoughts and those words that fall in line with that new almost social standard. Um, is that something you saw much of as prime minister? And do you think it's got worse since you've left? I ask this because in your book, you talk about how journalists and media back when you were in office, especially towards the end, were more left leaning. Oh, yes. Yeah. Look, um, I think I, when, I, when I was prime minister, and I've continued to do so, I described the Liberal Party of Australia as a broad church. Uh, and it was the, I said it was the trustee of two great political traditions, the classical liberal tradition uh, and the conservative tradition. And when I describe myself as somebody who is socially conservative, but economically liberal. I believe very strongly in reforming our economy and freeing the labor market in taxation reform, uh, open trading, uh, getting rid of tariff protection, not that there was much left by the time we came to power. But on social issues, I mean, I, everybody knows I, I voted against uh, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage, now it's happened. And, uh, you know, the majority who participated in the rather uneven plebiscite voted the other direction, but that's fine. Um, uh, the world moves on, hasn't come to an end by any means. But I, I just use that as an illustration uh, of, of perhaps my social conservatism. Now, I've always said to my colleagues that there has to be room in, in the Liberal Party of Australia for a breadth of views. Uh, I don't think, and I, on this score, I would respectfully disagree with my uh, former colleague and prime ministerial successor, Malcolm Turner. I don't think the Liberal Party is becoming hostage to the extreme right. There's a, a debate going on about um, climate change. And, and in that respect, um, the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom is, is greener, uh, if I can use that expression, uh, than the Liberal Party in Australia. And it's more you know, it's signed up uh, more enthusiastically to Paris than, than we have. Uh, and, and there are reasons for that. I mean, you don't depend as heavily on uh, you know, commodity exports like coal and iron ore and uh, natural gas for your export income. So, I mean, we've got to be realistic about these things. Uh, I can remember having a discussion years ago with Tony Blair about this, and he was boasting about how you know, Britain was able to reduce the emission because they closed down all these coal mines. And I reminded him that the Labor Party, when those coal mines were being closed down, vigorously opposed to all those closures. But uh, we move on to another subject after that. But I should say, incidentally, for the record, 
Um, I, I enjoyed a very good relationship with Mr. Blair and it was in the interest of both our countries that we got on and for the whole time that he was Prime Minister of Great Britain, I was Prime Minister of Australia. So, uh, um, you know, I was obviously happy to see a Conservative government get elected. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much we can discuss about um, your political career. Um, what I love about your journey is the comebacks you had. Um, and it's really well demonstrated in your book. You know, you became the leader of the Liberal National Party, as you said earlier, for the 1987 election, uh, but ultimately lost to Bob Hawke. You then came back as leader in 1995. Um, what had you learned from your experience in the election defeat in 1987? And did that shape much of how you were going to tackle the 1996 election? I think the thing I learned most of all was how to better relate to my colleagues uh, and, and um, uh, to, to, to give real substance to the broad church view. Um, there, there, there were always people <clears throat> in my parliamentary party that disagreed with some of our policies. For example, the controversial ones on, on asylum seekers. Uh, and on controlling um, uh, unauthorised arrivals in Australia, and that was seen by some in the community as being a bit harsh, but it was the right policy. And, and I think you've seen in Europe that, that whenever a domestic population feels that immigration is out of control, um, they get nervous about immigration. But when they think it's under control, they're happy to have it. And, and uh, for example, uh, Australia over the last few years after the pandemic struck, um, our three largest uh, source countries uh, for immigration were India, China, and Britain slash Ireland, in that order, for the last several years. Now, I don't think anybody can suggest that that is a, a policy which is discriminatory or, or anything other than open. And, we, and, and uh, ch uh, Chinese, which is a combination of Mandarin and Cantonese, is the most widely spoken foreign language in Australia. Now, by far, it used to be years ago, it used to be Greek or Italian. But, uh, uh, and, and Sydney is, is a very large and vibrant uh, Chinese population. And, uh, and, and, and I think the Indian population is, has a sort of a similar uh, influence in Melbourne. I mean, but there's large numbers of people of Indian descent in Sydney as well. Uh, and you, you see them in fourth of cricket games, I'm happy to say. <laughs> You, had, um, you, you find yourself became prime minister um, in, in the 1996, and um, unfortunately, shortly after, uh, a 28 year old troubled man walked into a cafe and opened fire with a semi automatic rifle, killing uh, 35 and wounding more. Um, you had been prime minister for just six weeks uh, when this occurred, and but you, you would go on to draft the National Firearms Agreement. Now, the, the effects of that agreement are quite frankly incredible. Um, the average suicide rate in Australia, uh, seven years after the bill, declines by 57% um, compared with the seven years prior. Um, the average um, fire, uh, fire homicide rate went down by 42%. That, that single policy changed Australia and um, it's since saved thousands of lives. I want to ask you about what it was like drafting the National Firearms Agreement, and maybe you could explain to some of our younger viewers what that meant for Australia at the time. Well, I think one of the significant things is that the power, the constitutional power to prohibit or restrict the use of firearms was with the Australian states. So I really had to, um, um, in, in a sense, um, um, Suggest to the states that if they didn't agree to what we wanted and in that common legislation, then, then we might have a, a referendum and to alter the constitution to give the power to the federal government. Now, at that time, the, the people would have voted overwhelmingly uh, to transfer the power because there was outrage. But I have to say that the states were uh, supportive. And I'd only been prime minister for six or seven weeks. I had a huge majority, and you're very popular at the beginning, and eventually <laughs> changes. Uh, and 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 any, but most importantly, people thought it was the right thing to do. There was some resistance from some 
people in rural areas, some farmers felt that they were being denied the use of weapons in their daily activities. And it was pretty tough on my National Party colleagues, that's the country party, minor party in the coalition, now called the National Party. And, and I had a lot of help from senior figures in that. And I'm very grateful for that help. But um, it was a very successful exercise. And I remember the day after it happened, I got a nice message, I got a, a message from John Major and he said to me, I never thought for a moment that uh, I'd be sending my sympathies to somebody uh, whose country has suffered a larger number of deaths and Britain suffered it in the Dunblane massacre in Scotland, which had occurred only what, a few months prior to that. And, um, but there's no doubt it, 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 it reduced uh, the homicide rate, there's no doubt it reduced the suicide rate. There, was a lot of, there were a lot of suicides amongst young men, particularly in rural areas, many of them are struggling to get a job. And if there's a, a rifle lying around at home and they're feeling depressed, uh, sadly, uh, there was a tragic consequence. And uh, it, it has clearly worked. And I've found whenever there was a gun massacre in the United States, that often the American media would get in touch with me for an interview. And I, I, I would do them occasionally, but not often, because I respected the fact that America's got a different culture. Uh, they had a revolutionary war. <laughs> we didn't have, an, have to have any war to get our independence from Britain. They were happy for us to have it. So uh, in a very different circumstance. And we didn't have a civil war. The whole culture, gun culture in Australia, is, it's more akin to what it is in Britain. Uh, not the same, but uh, the, the similar societies on that particular issue. But it was... Um, some, a measure that had overwhelming support, except in those areas I've mentioned, particularly amongst women. Uh, I, I've I found women, a couple of women came up to me in the street not long after I brought in the laws and they, and they, and they said to me, look, we've never voted for you in our lives and we don't intend to, but gee, you're right about this and keep going. <laughs> I said, well, thanks very much. It's um, it's interesting you mentioned the states. I remember reading in your book how um, you received a really good reception from uh, the agreement, and then you gave a speech in Washington, was it? And the reaction wasn't quite. Oh, oh yes, I, the got, same. I, got, I No, I went to the presidential library of that wonderful yeah. 46, uh, <clears throat> 41, 40 first president George H. W. Bush, and and it was a wonderful gathering of. Republican supporters who felt as though I was at a Liberal Party fundraiser in Sydney and, and I was asked what were some of the wonderful things I'd, I'd done and I was proud of. And I said, well, we you know, fought beside America in the war against terror and I got a big cheer for that. <clears throat> we got the budget under control, a huge cheer for that. And we introduced uniform gun control and I got a, you know, there's a, an audible intake of air that they were horrified that I should mention that. Although I do say that after the meeting quite a number of women present in the audience came up to my wife and said, we completely agree with her husband, get on gun. Uh, but yeah. it's going to be very hard for it to change in America because it's a big country and there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I, I find the activity to bodies like the National Rifle Association for, uh, and it was just one of those subjects I steered clear of in my many discussions with my Republican friends in America. We just sort of recognise that it was a no-go area. It, it's well worth noting that, you know, when, when you became Prime Minister, you also started with a $9 billion deficit. Um, mm. you know, Rishi Sunak, the, the UK Chancellor yesterday, delivered his budget and um, it, it's been widely acknowledged. It's more, uh, and it's more of an important budget than usual, considering the circumstances the country's mm. uh, been in. You know, your your budget... Has it been well received? Um, being uh, part of the Conservative Party, I'm going to say it's been very well received. Um, and it, it seems um, like it's pretty strong. There's some projections that are saying that uh, our economy um, should hit the heights prior to COVID-19 by uh, next summer 2022. So that's pretty um, a good response. I think a lot of people expected it to take a bit longer. 
Um, so it's been fairly well received. Um, you know, your budget was also you know, considered a massive moment and uh, you would call the 96 budget uh, the most important of all budgets delivered. And um, you also described it as the best and bravest in 25 years. Just how important was that budget for the country and for Australia in years to come? Well, the great thing about it was that it, 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 it told the Australian public that we were serious about deficit reduction and, and we were determined to spread the burden of it as, as evenly as possible and fairly as possible through the community. The only area of expenditure that I said had to be exempted from any budget cuts was defence, because I felt very strongly that under the previous Labor government, defence had been ignored, not totally ignored, but had been shortchanged. And, and we needed a period of, of, of growth and consolidation in defence spending, and we kept to that. And it also meant that we could implement some of our other reforms uh, particularly to give greater relief to families in taxation. That was a, much a cornerstone of my campaign. Uh, and people expected uh, a, a tough budget. They, they voted for us because they felt uh, the economy uh, had to be treated and handled differently than it had been. And so far from uh, that budget which did include a lot of spending cuts and a lot of big reforms costing us support um, the reverse happened because not long after the budget was brought down there was a by-election caused in unusual circumstances because the person who'd won the seat she was a her name was jackie kelly and she was a former legal officer in the royal australian air force and she'd won uh, a hitherto safe labor seat with it swing of about 12 or 13 percent and there was some technical flaw in her citizenship she'd been born in New Zealand I think and hadn't renounced her New Zealand citizenship at all I know it seems a bit ridiculous um being that Australians and New Zealanders have brought together in most scraps in recent memory but um anyway we had to have a by-election <clears throat> uh, and um so far from losing the seat um, we actually increased our majority. I think the, the public had, were cranky that they had to vote again because they, many of them said to her, well, I thought we voted for you a few months ago. What are you, what's, they, were, they were not amused, but um, it, was an, it was an interesting political response, that budget. And, and often, if the expectation is that the government is going to introduce a a harsh budget or a firm budget or reform budget because that's what the nation's interests require. If they don't go ahead and do that, there's a sense of, of disappointment and letdown. And uh, I think we met expectations with that budget. And it laid the foundation for us returning to a surplus within just two or three years. So that was, a, that was the first of 11 budgets that Peter Costello delivered. He was the treasurer and deputy leader of the Liberal Party. And uh, it, it really laid the groundwork for uh, so much of our later uh, reform success. You mentioned uh, Peter Costello. Um, it, it's fair to say you two had a fairly mixed relationship. Um, on, on one hand, he was your treasurer for 11 years. On, on the other hand, it seems he ultimately wanted your job. How did you manage that? On, on the surface, it seems like a very tough regular battle, um, but how did you manage that sort of relationship? Well, we were very close on policy issues. We, our view of the world was similar on economics, uh, foreign policy, when we had the, took the difficult decision uh, to join the coalition of the willing in Iraq, uh, he was 100% you know, on side and he shared all of my views about the importance of the defence alliance with the United States. Uh, he, he obviously had ambitions uh, to be leader and, and would have liked to have seen the leadership transition while we were still in government. Um, how was that managed? I think in the end, um, it was managed in a, in, in a quite a civil fashion. There, there were disagreements, but they weren't... Uh, uh, open and long running in the way that 
my dare I say, I think the relationship between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, both of whom I knew, uh, was was more open, uh, and it had a different history. But in the end, it was the feeling of the parliamentary party that I should stay. Uh, and uh, but Peter and I continued our very close professional relationship through all of it. But I'm not suggesting that he uh, didn't have a sense of disappointment. And another significant moment in your time as leader uh, was the terrible events of 9-11. Now, the day before the attacks, you had actually met George Bush for the first time. Uh, I understand you spent hours together, including talks over lunch at the White House and ultimately starting what became a strong political alliance and a personal friendship. F first of all, how was it being in the States when that happened? And secondly, did that play a part in your foreign policy? Um, as it was only a year later that we saw the horrific attacks in Bali, which killed um, 88 Australians. Well, um... I was in Washington on the 11th of September. I, I was in the middle of a press conference when the third plane hit the Pentagon. I was doing a press conference in the Willard Hotel, which is next to the White House. Um, it brought home to me the uh, audacity and the shock of the attack, the audacity of it from the Al Qaeda people, and also what a shock it was to the American people. It was, after all, a more brutal assault on the American homeland than Pearl Harbor, because it attacked New York, it attacked Washington. Um, it, it strengthened an already strong relationship between Australia and the United States. And I made it clear uh, before I left America to return home to Australia a couple of days after the attack that we would stand beside America in any um, uh, retaliation, as of course did um, <clears throat> Tony Blair and, and the, the, the support that Britain would go on to give to the United States was, was huge. Uh, and uh, uh, the size of the military commitment by Britain uh, was, was, was great, it was huge. And um, uh, George Bush and Tony Blair forged a good relationship. Um, and the, the truth is that the attacks of September 11 were not just attacks on the United States, but they were attacks on a way of life. And it was a way of life that uh, we shared with the Americans, we shared with the Brits. And, and I, I saw it very much as an assault uh, on the liberal democracies that all of us believe in. And uh, the other thing you've got to remember is that for a long time after the attack, the Americans expected another one. They lived in fear that there'd be another attack. And a lot of us, when the attack occurred, wondered the day after, on the 10th of September, when there would be an attack. Perhaps it was the beginning of a chain reaction of attacks. Perhaps there'd be one in London, one in Paris, one in Tokyo, maybe one in Sydney. We just didn't know. Uh, and it, that mindset is forgotten now, but it has to be remembered. And uh, but it was it was an extraordinary experience. I think the Americans reacted very calmly and very sensibly, but, and they appreciated very much the support they got from uh, Britain and Australia and other countries. Um, there's, a, there's a mistaken belief that the Americans are overwhelmingly self-confident about their place in the world. The truth is despite their immense size and power, the United States uh, often feels alone and vulnerable. And when it does get strong support from traditional friends and allies, it values it very greatly. Um, I, I think it's an interesting point you made uh, about the, um, the no attacks after 9-11. I think that's something probably the George Bush administration doesn't get much credit for, or it's not no, widely I spoken about. I didn't very much to the subsequent and, and, and controversial decision uh, in relation to Iraq. Of course, the belief that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction that could be passed to terrorist groups was genuinely based. Uh, I mean, I've never accepted the argument that 
the intelligence was falsified. It wasn't falsified. It was factually wrong in a number of respects. Uh, but the idea that it was just made up and invented has always been wrong and it's always um, offended me that people continue to make that argument. It was, I mean, I, I, I thought the criticism that was made of George W. Bush by Donald Trump when he was president was, was unreasonable uh, and uh, uh, not, not supported by reality. Yeah, I, I mean, Obviously, Iraq's quite a contentious point in, in, in the UK. Um, uh, I think it's something that you mentioned in the book as well. You know, this may have been a different story had uh, Saddam Hussein allowed the uh, UN Council to inspect Iraq and actually um, allowed them to go in and, uh, and do the inspection. Um, I mean, you know, your, your achievements speak for themselves. You know, Australia enjoyed uh, continued economic growth, averaging 3.6% per annum. Uh, you, your government delivered major economic reform in areas of taxation, workplace rela uh, relations, privatization, welfare. Um, 96 billion of the government debt was repaid during your time in the office. Uh, when you left office in November 2007, Australia had no net debt um, and its budget was in surplus. You know, this strong fiscal position, you could argue, was a major reason why Australia suffered relatively few consequences from the global uh, financial crisis. Do you think that was a major factor in why oh, look, Australia- I think there were two reasons why we suffered comparatively little from the 2008 downturn. The first of them was that the books were healthy, that we had a big surplus and the strong economy that we had left behind the previous year meant that the new incoming government had the wherewithal for a fiscal stimulus, it had money in the bank. I think that was the first. And the other uh, fortuitous factor was our resource trade with North Asia. Um, I mean, we were fortunate that we were selling uh, huge volumes of iron ore and natural gas and particularly thermal coal. Uh, which is very valuable for steel making to China and not only China, but also Korea and Japan. And, and that was hugely important because in many respects, the global financial crisis was a, uh, was a North Atlantic crisis. It, it affected the nations of Europe and North America a lot more heavily than it did other parts of the world. And the fact that we had this strong economic link with North Asia uh, was, was very, very valuable. So they're the two reasons why we came through that. And, and some of the stimulus, let, let me be fair, some of the stimulus measures of the Labor government that have replaced mine, uh, which was led by Kevin Rudd, some of those measures were justified and they were supported uh, by the Liberal and National Parties in opposition, but they became uh, too lavish. And in other words, a lot of money was spent that didn't need to be spent. And one of the reasons it was spent was, of course, it was there. And uh, we left it behind. Some said we'd left behind a lazy balance sheet. That's, a, that's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, a, a massive talking point on our platform um, is Kanzuk. So for our listeners, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, um, it's a relationship that's been discussed in in great detail. Obviously, our ties are very strong and we have a lot of shared history. Um, and there are talks that this alliance could um, come in the form of a, a more of a formal agreement. Um, it would mean that the uh, alliance would become the second most powerful geopolitical union uh, behind the European Union and quite possibly the fourth largest economic union behind China. Um, you know, the, the proposed bloc would mean three of the world's largest uh, top 15 economies, along with New Zealand. Uh, which lies in 54, um, and, and cover more than 136 million people. Um, Kanzuk would have the large, world's largest land mass and, and therefore um, the biggest supply of natural resources. What are your views on a potential Kanzuk agreement? I think um, it, 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 it's, a con, it's a nice concept. Uh, and, I, and I understand the the emotion behind it, but you have to come up against certain realities and perhaps find 
other ways of just as effectively achieving cooperation. I mean, the first point I've got to make is that one of the most valuable arrangements that both Britain and Australia belong to at the moment is the Five Eyes Intelligence Arrangement. And, and, and that arguably is more valuable than just about any other uh, defence arrangement because timely intelligence is so valuable. And of course, that Five Eyes includes the United States, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and Australia. And the other thing you have to bear in mind is that the trading relationship between Australia and Britain and New Zealand and, and Canada to a lesser extent changed forever once Britain joined the European Union way back in, in the 1970s. And although Britain has now left the European Union, it's not, one of, it's not a question where you can go back to what it was. It, it, life's not like that because in that interim period, different markets have been developed. Now, having said all of that, I'm in favour uh, as somebody who's uh, all his political life believed in the importance of the links between Australia and Britain. Why I was, one of the reasons why I was a, a, a strong opponent of Australia becoming a republic. Um, I, having said all of that, I'm in favour of building uh, a close trade relationship and a close strategic relationship. Now, whether and what ultimate form that takes. Um, uh, is a matter for debate, but we can be certain of this, that even when our trading relationship is, uh, has been in the doldrums, it hasn't really affected the, um, uh, the centre between the two countries. It's always been strong. And every so often there's a poll conducted in Australia by a think tank about asking Australians to list the countries they most warmly identify with and happy to tell you that Britain and New Zealand and uh, and Ireland. Uh, a lot of sentiment for Ireland and Australia. A lot of Irish influence in our country. I'm happy to say, um, there's always near the top, um, and and that hasn't really altered. Uh, uh, and I think what it suggests is that the values we have in common are the things that still matter most to people. And obviously, the family links and the language and the sport, all of these things. They, keep us together, although we yell and shout at each other on the football and cricket first and so on. But whether you get a Kanzak, I mean, it's possible, but I think you have to recognise that in the post-Brexit world, there is a, a great opportunity to build a closer trade relationship, but it's not a question of going back to what it was because the, the essence of the British decision in the early 1970s uh, was to abandon uh, the old Ottawa imperial preference arrangement. And that had a very big effect on uh, agriculture, particularly the very efficient producers in both Australia and New Zealand. And although it was possible to accommodate New Zealand because of a relative size more than Australia, it did have an effect fortuitously for Australia we had opened up a, a trade relationship with Japan and when we discovered iron ore uh, in Western Australia, we were able to sort of fill the gap and we we're very lucky. But look, the desire to have a close relationship is there. Uh, but the other observation I make is that um, um, it's the values and the sentiment and the common commitment to the rule of law, liberal democracy, a parliamentary system, free press, and, and a rough similarity in our sense of humour. They're the, they're the sort of things that, that keep uh, the, the countries together. You mentioned the Republic, and I think it's a, a good time to bring in, we had this question from Michael J. Smith. Um, he, he wanted your opinion on the future of the monarchy in Australia. Now, the, the world obviously changed drastically from the early 90s arguments of Paul Keating, that Australia needed a republic and a flag to um, better define itself in its region. Do you believe that Keating's views now are still very distant and irrelevant? Um, or, or do you think this is a discussion that we may have again sometime in the future? Well, I'd say a couple of things. I'd say firstly, at the moment, there is absolutely no <clears throat> surge of support for the public. Nobody is interested in the subject. Um, uh, except in a very academic way. 
uh, it was barely raised with me after the referendum, which I sponsored, although I voted no and campaigned for no, I, I, I promised to give people a vote on it. And I kept that promise. And I voted 55% for uh, the monarchy and 45% for a republic. And what that tells me is, is there'll always be uh, a, a section, significant section of the Australian population, not out of hostility to Britain, but just saying, well, we should not share a head of state um, with another country. It diminishes our independence. Now, I don't think it does. And uh, I found as I moved around the world, particularly in Asia as Prime Minister, nobody ever mistook me for Prime Minister of another country. They understood we were a sovereign, independent nation. But it is an unusual arrangement that you have 14 or 15 countries, and, uh, including obviously Australia and Canada and New Zealand, uh, that, uh, and a number of other small countries that share the same head of state. Now, okay, well, that's something that uh, is a reality and people are comfortable with that. The majority of Australians are comfortable with it. I do think the extraordinary respect and affection in which the Queen is held and, and the fact that she's been there for so long and has been a fixture in the understanding of most Australians. Uh, uh, I mean, I was, I think, 12 when she came to the throne and I will turn 82 this year, so that's a fair chunk of my, my life. And um, now clearly uh, it's one of those things that you can, you cannot say that, that Australia will never become a republic. Of course you can't say that. It's a matter of uh, the will of the people. And uh, I mean, I made it very clear on the eve of the referendum that the Australian people voted for change or sad though I would be about it, I would facilitate it, I respect it. And that's understood, it's understood by the, by the monarch, it's understood by you know, the members of the family. Um, I, people say to me, do you think Australia will ever become a republic? Well, what do you think now? And I say, no, there's no push. What do you think about the future? I said, come back in 10 years time and ask me. Or five years time and ask me. Uh, but right at the moment, uh, there's no, and, and, and I, I think in a way, the very stability of our political system and the relative success we've had would lead to a lot of people think, why do we not change anything? Um, uh, so there's, there's certainly less natural Republican sentiment in Australia at the moment than there was in the 1990s, but that's not to say it might in certain circumstances come back. It, it will always be an issue, but uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the no's have it very heavily. We, we, we've had um, quite a few questions almost in the follow-up to um, the identity politics that we were talking about a bit earlier. Um, I, I'm going to bring in some, but we, we had uh, a uh, official who worked in the White House, Robert Spalding, um, under the, the previous administration. And uh, he, he said something that I think resonates quite well with the chats we were having earlier, um, which was he, he believes there's almost an emergence um, in the greater minority are the more you almost move up the social ladder. Um, so if you can prove that you've been more oppressed when it comes to history, you're therefore special and almost put to the top of the chain rather than it being about who is best, most knowledgeable, has the best quality. And it seems people with the greater injustices in terms of history, ancestry, sexuality, race, are the ones who almost we tend to now have to look to seek guidance from. Is that something you, you, you feel that's happening in Australia? Because there oh, seems yeah, to be an emergence in the UK. It's, it's a common phenomenon around the world, uh, particularly in what I care to describe as the Western world. Um, and uh, uh, it's a varying degrees um, with varying intensities, but uh, it's an issue that has to be confronted and has to be argued skillfully. Uh, the merit principle must always be defended, um, uh, but there has to be an understanding that um, claims of disadvantage uh, in some instances are properly based, uh, but it should never be, uh, as you've referred to, a situation that uh, if you are part of a minority, if you're whether it's 
a large minority or a small minority, then automatically you should get to the top of the queue. I mean, there has to be uh, a, a proper adjustment made. It's a question of, a, of achieving a balance. Nobody wants minority people you know, poorly treated and all political parties must always strive to have a, a, you know, a reasonable level of gender balance and how you come about it uh, in a way that doesn't ignore the merit principle, I think is it, not all that difficult. Uh, and and you know, I've looked at the composition uh, of, of uh, the senior ranks of the current British government and, and it's, I think there's very heavy, rep significant representation in very senior positions. Uh, of, of people who have a what I might loosely call a subcontinental uh, ethnic background, and that's that's good because it reflects the modern British state. Uh, and um, I mean, it would not surprise me in time that you might have significant figures of, um, of Chinese ethnicity in, in in parliaments in Australia, because there are 1.4 million Australians out of 25 million whose uh, ethnicity is Chinese. Uh, now they're the sort of things that, that they should be allowed to evolve in a in a natural way, and and any barriers on the way up should be removed. But there shouldn't be uh, a sort of prescriptive approach that says, well, we've got to choose him for that seat because he's got a Chinese or an Indian background, or when the best candidate for the seat is, is a Smith, a Kelly, or a McDonald. Um, the question of adopting a common sense approach. It's, um, it's, it's an interesting talking point. We've discussed quite a bit on this platform. We, we've had um, a, a really good question in from uh, Samuel Ennis. Um, he, he's asking, do you think it was right to lock down the economy and ignore the microeconomic and macroeconomic consequences? Well, I think it, it, it depends on the extent of the lockdown. I think some lockdown was absolutely essential and it worked in Australia. Um, I know there's been a lot more debate in Britain about the extent of the lockdown. Uh, and <clears throat> I think one of the differences, as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the travel from the rest of the world wasn't closed down as sharply and as comprehensively in Britain as it was in Australia. I think our decision very early to lock off travel from China and from other parts of the world was, was very useful. Um, and um, I think from the very beginning um, here in Australia, there was a, a feeling that yes, there had to be a lockdown, but uh, if we could uh, make certain that, that we had a good contact tracing system, that seemed to me to be the key to a lot of the success we've had uh, in Australia, that we were able to trace people who had contact with those who developed. And there was never any really, we, we didn't um, get caught up with the idea of herd immunity being the, the quick answer. It could never be quick. Uh, but I mean, I, I hesitate because different circumstances, I and mean, we pandemic struck them, we still had. You know, very warm weather. We're an island continent. Uh, uh, the contrast, I mean, sure, Britain's a <laughs> British Isles is surrounded by a bit of water, but your weather was very different. And, and I think the, the, the incidence of people living in much closer quarters in many parts of Europe, I mean, I'm always struck by how very high the death rate was in Belgium. I'd always understood as one of the still one of the most densely populated countries in Europe, and I think those uh, natural factors of, of living have had a big impact. And we are a nation that's for a long time it's changing, but for a long time it's uh, uh, it had a lot of people living in single dwellings with a you know, small uh, front and backyard. Now all those things do come into play when you're trying to contain the spread uh, of the pandemic. But I think that some lockdown was essential. Uh, the debate has always been about the duration and the extent of it. You, you briefly touched on it there, and we've talked a bit about uh, Asia. Um, 
I, I want to ask what you feel um, the future relationship would, is going to look like for Australia and China in particular. It's a massive talking point in the UK uh, about what our relationship with China uh, should look like. Uh, there's MPs in support of keeping the sort of relationship we have now. There's some that are saying we need to go more distant, um, not just on because of COVID-19, but because of some of the practices that they're, uh, that they're doing. How do you see that for Australia? Well, it's a huge debate in our country uh, as well. Um, I think Australia has a very delicate balancing act with China. China is hugely important to us economically. It's our largest export destination. And um, we can't lightly ignore that. Um, uh, and, um, but I think Relationships with China, particularly with Australia, and I think also perhaps to a lesser extent relationship with China and Britain, uh, are dependent on how the relationship between America and China evolves. It is the most important bilateral relationship in the world by far. And, um, but we've all got to understand that China has changed at the top. China under Xi Jinping is a far more assertive, uh, aggressive country in the international arena than it was under his two predecessors. And we've got to think ahead about Taiwan, if Taiwan could well become something of a, a flashpoint between the Americans and the Chinese. And what China has done in relation to Hong Kong has changed the scene enormously. I thought 10 years ago that <clears throat> something akin to the Hong Kong arrangement might be worked out between Taiwan and China. I don't think that is the least bit possible now. And, and <clears throat> the way in which China has trampled on the agreement made in 1997 between Britain and China about Hong Kong is, is quite intimidating. Having said all of that, we have to accept that China is a rising power. Uh, well, not only it's, it's a risen power, it's just getting stronger, but we should also not be mesmerised by the Chinese. China has two enormous challenges. One of them is demography. China is, is an ageing country uh, and population growth in the United States, let alone in other countries, is much higher than it is in China. It's in fact overlooked by many people. And I think the other thing that, that has to be said about China, it's a long-term consideration. And that is that as more and more Chinese people are born into the middle class and, and have greater opportunities and greater choice, uh, uh, they're more likely, I think, in the long run to demand a say in how they're governed. If you transition from um, serfdom to freedom in your lifetime, you're grateful for the, for the relative freedom. But if you're born with freedom, you just take it for granted. And uh, I think it's a factor that will work its way out. But it's a difficult relationship. And, and, and uh, I think there'll be a bit of shadow boxing between the Chinese and the Americans. And we have to keep an eye on that. And we, I mean, I, I say to Australian audiences, people say, oh, what about China and America? How do you balance them? I say, look, we'll always be closer to America. We are to China because we have common values. So I said earlier. Uh, the values unite people far more effectively and enduringly than trade, important though trade is. So we've got to balance all of that up. But you know, speaking as an Australian, that economic relationship with China is very strong, very important, and we have to handle it with care. Uh, another uh, talking point, um, obviously with us along the part of the European Union, uh, we're regularly talking about immigration. What, what should the, the UK's immigration uh, policy look like and how it should work? And it's almost a, an evolving process at the moment. Do, do you think the UK can learn uh, some things from the Australian point, state, uh, point system style policy? Well, I, I know Boris Johnson likes the point system because he keeps talking about it, and that's good. Um, look, I, I hesitate to uh, sort of determine about migration is a sensitive issue. And Britain was an incredibly open country. Uh, I, I, from way back and, and, and uh, has, and obviously you've had 
share of challenges sometimes in integration and whatever, but um, you, you, no government can ignore migration. And I think migration was an issue in, in the Brexit referendum. I think the, the way in which people felt governments were losing control uh, of population movements, which they clearly seem to be, uh, was a factor. And I've always found in Australia that if you look as though you are controlling migration, deciding who comes according to the interests of your own country, the public will support migration. And, and I mean, we have absorbed people from all around the world. Uh, and and we, after World War II, we took uh, large numbers of people from Greece and Italy, from the Baltic countries, from Germany, and, and, and then as time progressed from from Lebanon, and then uh, after the White Australia policy was thankfully dismantled, we take large numbers of people from, from Asia. And I was talking earlier about the source countries. And because all the while, we continue to take large numbers of people from Britain and Ireland. And that was a traditional migration source, has been, will, I have, will always continue to be. Um, but you have to understand that people who are living in the country, whether they're living in Britain or they're living in Australia, uh, they want to be satisfied that the flow of migration is something that the government's got an eye on. And when the government sounds as though it's lost control, or worse still said, that it doesn't matter who comes, uh, they're, they're not going to accept that. No, no government can ignore it. And uh, I think, um, you know, judging by what people told me, British people told me that the, the, the sense of migration from parts of Eastern Europe was virtually uncontrolled into Britain under the European Union arrangements was a, was a factor in the, ref, in the, in the Brexit uh, referendum. Not the only factor, but a factor. And it was, it, it was relevant to the issue of, dare I say, taking back control. It's, you know, I recollect it was quite a strong control, a slogan, wasn't it, in the Brexit referendum? Yeah, it was strong. I think immigration was definitely a... Um a massive uh, talking point. It's probably the biggest reason we voted to leave. Um, it, it's something interesting. I, I remember Hillary Clinton, um, just before the referendum, um, almost pleaded with the European Union um, to essentially say, you know, you need to, uh, I think at the time it was the refugee crisis. There was a lot of refugees that were mm. coming in to the European Union. She pleaded with the European Union, basically saying, look, you've got the UK referendum coming up. Germany have got elections coming up soon just calm down with the amount of refugees you're taking you know there may not this may not be an issue it may be okay but public perception in these countries uh, you don't want to lose these countries and you don't want um to uh, you, you don't want a uk out of the the european union and the european union flatly refused and didn't listen um so that played a massive part and i think immigration and the general um consensus i think in our country of the idea of being governed by unelected officials um, oh, that, that, I mean, for me, that was a no-brainer. Um, uh, you should you know, if the the nation state is still alive and kicking, and uh, um, the idea that you had to uh, concede ever growing amount of sovereignty to a central unelected body was just uh, something that I'm not surprised people have rejected. I'm glad they did. It, it kind of leads me on actually to my next question, uh, which is on nationalism. Um, mm. You know, every time we seem to mention nationalism in certain sections of this country, I think it almost has a lot of negative connotations. Um, us generally as conservatives, we, we tend to um, look at it as a, you know, something that a country needs to have some nationalistic uh, views. You need to be proud to be British, you know, otherwise, boy, you're not going to put, you're not going to pay taxes, you're not going to contribute to society. Do, do you think that's um, something that's happening in Australia? Um, is there a lack of nationalistic views there? But of course, we never had a situation that you had for 40 years of, of surrendering our sovereignty um, to a group of countries. We didn't do that. And, and I mean, I can remember very vividly when the first negotiation started of Britain's entry in the early 70s, the late 60s, and my very distinguished predecessor, Robert Gordon Menzies, said, you know, Britain's got to understand that once she joins this, there will be ever-increasing 
commands to transfer power to the center. And you'll have a relationship which is very different from what exists now. And he was right. And, and, and Britain gave up a lot of sovereignty. We've never given up sovereignty. Um, uh, I mean, we, for example, uh, when Brexit was first decided, I understand there were discussions between the British and Australian governments for some of our trade officials to talk to some of your trade officials about negotiating trade agreements because he had surrendered that authority and, uh, to the European Union. Now, I'm not saying any of this critically, or, you know, it's a, it's a fact. And, and um, so therefore, the, the nationalism of which you speak is not such an issue here because it's never been compromised uh, uh, in, in the past. The threats to it have been external uh, through war and the like, which was you suffered uh, uh, even, even more so. But um, so that's, but I mean, the nation state is still a principal organizing uh, method internationally. And I often say to people in the context of our own region that the, uh, the most significant Asian regional figure of my lifetime in many respects has been the late Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. And uh, Lee Kuan Yew was the essence of a nationalist. Uh, he, his country was pushed out of the Federation of Malaysia and he built a, a wonderful, powerful little country. And, and it was very nationalistic, but uh, nationalistic in the best sense of that word, a pride in your country, uh, a belief that you've all got to pull together and to use what resources you have. Now, I understand the argument about the great thing about the European Union was that it brought together the, the two antagonists, Germany and France, which had been at the heart of two of the most terrible, the two terrible wars. I mean, as an Australian, I understand that very well because we were, we were from the very beginning, we were, we were part of both of those contests, both of those uh, uh, terrible conflagrations. But you can have a, an association between countries that uh, renders a repetition of that uh, remote unlikely without having all of the transfer of power that was involved with the European Union. And I felt over time that that was pleaded as the defence and the explanation uh, unreasonably because you could eliminate the necessity for that without all the paraphernalia that was involved in the transfer of power. I, I think it's uh, what you're saying is pretty much where because a lot of the sort of UK sentiment at the time and still currently, I think it it felt like almost forced integration um, mm. at times with the with the union and um, and I think that really was something that uh, as Brits we didn't really like and it's not something that I think um, many people were for um, and th this kind of leads me well to uh, a question we've had in from Eddie um, who's asked. Can you see the EU lasting uh, uh, in the long term? And what do you think the implications would be for the UK and the West? Oh, um, I think it'll last for quite a while. I think it's, there, there, there was always a, an uncomfortable characteristic about Britain's place in Europe. I always felt that a lot of British people, even though they may have reason it was a good idea, they just felt it was an unnatural fit. Um, I, 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 I think the European Union will, in its present form, will last, but um, uh, I do. Um, I think it will perhaps have quite a big debate about whether they centralise more power or become a bit more federalist in their approach. And I think it's interesting how uh, more rapidly, Britain has been able to uh, roll out the vaccine uh, compared with uh, the European Union. And perhaps a lot of people will say, I may be wrong, if you're saying in Britain, well, that's what happens when you get freedom to move on your own. You can do it according to your own needs and do it rapidly. You know, I, I don't think that's a valid comment, but it, it strikes me from a distance that it might be. Another. Um something that I wanted to talk about and it's still relevant now is uh, Pauline Hanson, um, the founder in, uh, and leader of One Nation. 
Um, you, you mentioned her in your book and in, in, in general, it's mentioned quite a bit of her impact uh, when she almost exploded onto the scene um, in, in the mid nineties. Um, what effect did One Nation at the time have or, or, or her uh, as a person when you were seeking initially to become prime minister and then the years afterwards? Well, she didn't exist until um, uh, started in 96, the election. Just brief history for people who don't understand. Pauline Hanson had been endorsed as the Liberal candidate for a hitherto safe Labor seat based on the city of Ipswich uh, in, in Queensland. And um, she was disendorsed. She lost her party endorsement uh, uh, and uh, on the eve of the election because she made some, I thought, quite outrageous comments about Indigenous disadvantaged, Aboriginal disadvantaged, which I, I thought were, they were wrong and they, they sounded bigoted. And so we took away her endorsement, but she ran as an independent. But because it was so late in the, in, in the election cycle, that the name Liberal was still under her name on the ballot papers. And, and she won with a huge majority. And what had happened is that a lot of traditional Labor voters in that seat, uh, who were cranky with the Labor government. They did, but they didn't want to vote for me. Uh, eight was in death. So they said, oh, we'll vote for her. She, she's sort of a bit of both. She's, she's not a fully certified Liberal, but she's not Labor, so we'll vote for her. And then later on, of course, she made a, a speech in, in Parliament and, and formed a separate political party. Um, I, I think that... Um, um, she's become sort of part of the furniture uh, and over the years uh, her support has ebbed and flowed but I think this is a, a phenomenon of all of our societies that politics is less tribal I used to believe when I was first involved in politics in what I call the 40-40-20 rule 40% 40 of people always voted Liberal 40% always voted Labor and 20 moved around in the middle. I now think it's a 30-30-40 rule. The People's Party allegiances are not as rusted on. And I'm sure it's the case in Britain that you don't have quite as many people who you know, would, 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 would never do anything other than vote Conservative or never do anything other than vote Labor. I mean, look what happened with the, the last election and the so-called red wall seats uh, that Boris Johnson uh, so magnificently won. Um, so I think She's part of that. Um, what has been her permanent effect? Well, because we have a Senate, which is elected by directly by the people uh, in full franchise, and the system of voting for the Senate is proportional representation, it is possible for minor parties to have uh, representation in Parliament that would not occur with the first past the post voting system. So I think that's one of the re the, the, the structural differences between Australia and Great Britain that uh, are relevant. It's interesting you mentioned about politics not being as tribal. Um, we've had uh, a number of people um, on this platform kind of having this discussion about how it's almost harder to have uh, conversations about politics um, and almost have a difference in opinion. I, I'm going to give you Bill Clinton's quote, um, which I, I think resonates really well. He, he essentially said a couple of years ago that we are less racist, less homophobic um, than we've ever been before. But the biggest difference is now we no longer want to be or can be in uh, rooms with people who think different to us. Do you mm -hmm. think that's something that's happening in I, general I the Western is, world? I think that is happening around issues. When I, I use tribal in the sense of party identification. Right. And I think there is a difference. I think I, there's nothing inconsistent with recognising that there are fewer people who think they're automatically liberal, or automatically yep. liberal in Australia. But people feel perhaps more argumentative, more intent on individual issues. And, and, that, and those individual issues can cross party political lines. And, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I found fascinating about the referendum we had in Australia on the Republic all of the inner city electorates in Sydney, whether they were Labor or Liberal, 
voted voted for for Republicans. But by the time you got out from the inner city, they, in my view, found their senses and they they voted against it. And so that cross party lines, you get you do get that, uh, and I think that's what the point Clinton was making, and it makes a lot of sense to me. But the tribal thing expression I use is really in relation to the political label or identification. It, it's fascinating because uh, the I learned a lot of stuff on on the Republic uh, from yourself and. Um, I obviously didn't know that Malcolm Turnbull was uh, the uh, oh, well, Malcolm the, the leader. Was, was, was on the wrong side on that, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I was happy uh, to have him in my cabinet. Uh, you have to. It was part of the broad church. He was at the other end of the pew. Yeah, it's uh, another thing that uh, I, I've spoken with him and, and other people um, quite a bit about is the transformation of the media. Um, you know, I think a lot of people um, have now started seeing um, journalism as almost as propaganda. Um, how do we... Oh, yeah, almost... yeah, so the media has become more polarised. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no doubt about that. You, I watch a lot of um, CNN and Fox, and, uh, very different. And, and, and public broadcasters. One of the big differences, the BBC is still more pervasive in, in Britain than, than any public broadcaster I know. Uh, I, I think uh, a few probably conservative people on this platform may disagree uh, with the BBC. I think it's, it's a lot of, um, one of the issues I think we're, we're seeing quite a lot with BBC and Sky and ITV and is I think a lot of people sort of feel, and this was shown in the last election, is a lot of these media organizations are almost enforcing their social uh, opinions and social beliefs oh, yeah, well, on. Yeah, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that. And I'm just saying that the BBC has greater influence, I think. In, oh, sorry, yeah. And more pervasive in that sense. I oh, know, I agree with you. The yeah, BBC, and, and obviously, like the ABC in Australia has a, a Bit of a fixed agenda of issues that it wants to run, and uh, uh, but it's. I think the sense I've always had is that the BBC's dominance of news in in Britain Definitely. is greater than what the ABC is in Australia. Definitely, I think um, the other thing that's very different about the Australian media scene is that talkback radio has always been hugely influential in Australian politics. So I don't think it's as great in Britain. Um, that, that was something I actually want to mention about um, radio because you, you did a lot of radio yeah, I did appearances. A lot of radio. Is that something you preferred as opposed to no, one, TV? One of the reasons I preferred it was that it was a way of communicating directly with people. And, and if I had something to say, it wasn't uh, uh, moderated or uh, embellished or whatever by my news editor. And, and if you've got a, a big radio audience, even if they only listen to you for five minutes, that's five minutes of you talking directly to hundreds of thousands of people. And I thought that was a very effective method of, of bypassing uh, such prejudice that might exist in the mainstream media. Yeah. I think the equivalent probably to now is podcasts. I think that's becoming oh, more yeah. and more. Oh, well, yeah, enormous amount of that, yeah. Uh, popular. Um, as we sort of come to a closing, I wanted to mention also... Uh, uh, Sillington Crosby, we, we, we had him recently on our platform, oh, yeah. he spoke very highly of you um, and one of the, the things he mentioned uh, that you were really successful at and, and really good at, at the time we were talking about the, um, it was the US election was going on between Biden and Trump and he, he felt one of the great things that you did in comparison to, to Biden um, was that the, the walks, you know, the, the um, people regularly uh, filming you going for walks and he felt that even as you got older, then there was never a question of your age um, because they would see a fit John Howard going for walks. And he was at the time criticizing Biden because he's saying, you know, he, he just seems doesn't do as doesn't do that as much for his age. You know, he needs to be showing that he's active and showing that he's um, uh, physically compatible. And he really complimented on uh, that walking strategy or just the general walks that you, you would do. Was that? planned or was that just something no, that no, just no. I mean, happened? I'm, I'm very interested in the observation that it turned out to be politically helpful and, and I hadn't actually thought of that much but I started doing it years ago 
before, long before I was Prime Minister, because uh, uh, I have the view that as you get older, you've got to remain mobile. And once you get into the habit of uh, walking vigorously for half, three quarters of an hour in the morning and doing a few exercises, it becomes part of your routine. And I did it. I mean, I had a, when I stayed in, came to London, I'd always start Claritons. And uh, I'd walk down you know, through what, Grosvenor Square and, and down, down to, Hot, to Hyde Park and back. Uh, it was just a regular, the same thing in, in Washington. And it's just a regular pattern. And, uh, and once when I became Prime Minister, which is embedded in my program, my security knew, and I, I was disciplined about the time. I didn't, you know, I had a fixed time each day uh, so that you weren't mucking people around if they all had things to do. But so, I, I, but it's interesting that it, it had the side effect of, of, of uh, people thinking, well, he's still, you know, <laughs> still perpendicular. I mean, um, basically relevant. <clears throat> I, I think uh, Salentin, yeah, it, it was something that he uh, really admired, and it's something that I think he's he was saying that he because he, he, he has his own consulting company, and it's something that he was um, talking about. Uh, he was, uh, yeah, great strategist, and a great, and he's pollster. I, I, I was at a dinner last night with Mark Sexton, who was a pollster, and uh, they were very good, and uh, they they gave me good access. It turned out to be pretty accurate uh, benchmark and tracking research. And um, I'm not surprised that he was widely respected by Boris Johnson. Boris was Lord Mayor, my first full minister of Asia. Michael Howard, um, uh, who's a good friend of mine, spoke warmly of him. And of course, uh, David Cameron did as well, very much so. And uh, I remember talking to Lyndon. On the eve of the 2015 election, I happened to be in London not long before that, and he was you know, telling me that he thought it was going to go very well. And we had a sort of a you know, bit of a session on talking about marginal seats, very much like he had when when he was advising me, and uh, he was very upbeat because it turned out to be pretty accurate. And it's uh, always good to have somebody like that in your corner. I think we had him on uh, on our show for a, a couple of hours, and I think you, you could see his mind frame. It was almost like, I felt like writing down some of his points throughout the whole thing. Is so uh, analytical and, and articulate in his points. Um, but yeah, you're right. He had the two Boris Johnson elections that he won, and then obviously the, the David Cameron 2015, and he discussed quite a bit in detail about um, linking. One of the things that us conservatives are generally very good at is uh, we're very good at making reasonable arguments. You know, we argue with a lot of reason. We talk a lot about economics. Um, but mm. one of the weaknesses is we don't link it to emotion. So we just expect the, the electorate to get what we're it's saying. You've got to combine the two. Yeah. You've got, you've got to combine the two. And, well, and was that something you actively did? Like, you know, you're I, 96. Well, I think it's the key like, to any success, you have to combine the two. Anyway, it's been great talking to you. Right, it's been fantastic. Thank you for uh, joining us today. It's been uh, uh, an amazing talk, and I, I know our listeners will have enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to do this in person one day. Um, I hope. Well, uh, I I'll, I'll, once again, visit. <laughs> um, I'll pass it over to Paul. Thanks well, very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today, John. It's really, really insightful. And um, we'd definitely like to yeah, uh, work, you know, do some, do another event in the future, whether that's in person or again online and continue, continue working with you. Just thank you for your time and been re really, really interesting. Yeah, well, good luck. And uh, let's hope that you beat India because we've got to get into that. that. Final. <laughs> but it's not looking good at the moment, I've got to tell you. <laughs> They're very good theme. We had a wonderful series in Australia, just completed. And, that was uh, a great series, yeah. And, and, and particularly that last test match in, in, in Brisbane. It was a wonderful performance by the Indians. They're a, they're very good cricketers, but anyway. I think it's rare to see yeah. an Indian team anyway. Now, my generation, I can actually bowl uh, this well or have fast bowlers. Uh, oh, yeah. Really... Yeah, and, 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 and uh, Rishbar, uh, the, uh, the wicket keeper, he's terrific. 
Yeah. We could do the best. Anyway. We could, we could, we could do uh, John Howard on, cr- on cricket next time. Too. <laughs> okay. Thank you, for your, thank you for your time. Thank you.